and writes at a blog spot. He co-directs the Poets and Writers Studio International, writes a weekly poem for Haiti on Marsh and El Accento. He has received fellowships at the Foundation of the Contemporary Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the U.S.-Mexico Fund for Culture, the McDowell Colony. He is a 2021 Emergency Grant winner. He hosts the Poetry Channel. Um, the, sorry? By, uh, he hosts the Poetry Channel, <laughs> new books including 10,000 Steps Against the Tyrant, Poet Lam Pala, Poet of the Port, and Islenio, which will be published in late 2021 and early 2022. Indrid Amir Thanayasal, please welcome to the poet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. How refreshing to have an introduction with, uh, with a critical eye in here. And, and and a commentary that I can learn from, and so I appreciate that very much. And, um, you know, uh, and an unbidden uh, introduction also. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to read from a few different books because, you know, I've been a traveler and I've been away from New York a long time. I used to live here. And so some of these books I've never really presented in New York, so I'd like to read a couple of poems from them. I'll start with The Splintered Face, which um, I did read once from in the city. Um, I wrote this after the tsunami of 2004, the great Asian tsunami as it's called, and how it affected the island of Sri Lanka, where I'm from, uh, you know, 35,000 people suddenly right to the coastline, so many more in Indonesia and in other countries, it's just a devastating thing, and I found out about it by on the radio in Rockville, Maryland, uh, on Boxing Day. And then uh, I was with my younger brother, my parents, my, it was the last, actually without my father, who just passed away. So it was a sort of a, an occasion of remembering him as well. And then my brother was on the island and other people on the island and they didn't have any news and they had all the anxiety and worry about what had happened to them. Eventually we heard they were okay, but um, of course 35,000 people uh, we're not on, the, on this particular country. Words and orchids. We had gone for a sea bath and had just sat down to eat mangoes and pitto, a spicy pole sambal. My husband was thrilled with home food and sea air. The orchids, the waiter, arranged elaborately on our table. I wanted the flowers moved because they blocked my view of the sea, but my husband insisted. He said the waiter had taken such trouble, and in the States, how often would we eat mangoes by an ocean framed with orchids? Those were his last words. When the first wave roared over us, I held on to a palm tree. Then as the water receded, ran and ran uphill. Met our friends there, but my husband stayed behind. I do not have his body, just these words about flowers his grin as he sucked mangoes with his hands. You know, I've been uh, writing and railing about borders most of my life. I, um, this one is called Borders. Let's not speak of countries or homelands. There's an ocean and beach full of bodies and a sea unaware of human calamity. Moon bright in some lover's eye, sparrows the morning after return to dance. Let's pick up the dead now, all the peace agreements, insurance papers. Let's walk across the borders now. Um, the uh, poet and writer Ed Ramanujan, A.K. Ramanujan, was very grateful, very grateful to him. Because he wrote a comment about my first book and he said, it's a welcome addition to the poetry of migration. And that phrase has stuck with me throughout. Poetry of migration, what does that mean? Actually, I've been plowing that field in different books. Um, here's a book called Coconuts on Mars, which was published in India in 2019. And um, I have copies of some of these books with me if anyone's interested. Um, I'll read the first poem, Coconuts on Mars. It's a prose poem. I've left my other languages to sit in the troughs of their foreign pens, snorting beautiful and strange cries, to be visited someday when I've gathered the force again, to leap beyond the white cliffs, 
to crash into the sea between island and old continent. But I forget my birth under a coconut tree. I forget too that I found fan-tailed palm trees when I visited Cornwall. You can imagine the perplexed grin I sported that weekend. The sun warming my skin in St. Ives as we walked among those <clears throat> English palms. I did not find the King Coconut agreed, but a cousin, a relation. We are all blood coursing through veins, each white and red cell identical in shape and substance, no matter the different clothes and names and histories we sport on our bodies, in our heads. I am rich in cells, and some are dividing still. Turmeric stops the decline. Persistence, repetition of sums, writing certainly, the ever-present chance of discovery, the blue canopied forest, a finch unlike any other, you, my dear, reading these lines. I can see through every glass in my mind. In short, let us not build any frontiers, as there are no strangers. In short, I compose this meditation in English, but anticipating <coughs> translating tool will transform my words into every other language on the planet. Ah, what a silly fantasy. As I write, the last speaker of a tribe in the Amazon forest will die. As I write, the trapped finch will bleed from the wire and lie down to die. As I write, a coconut tree will grow in an open air hothouse on the Cornish coast. As I write, 6,000 loaves will sprout and 60,000 fish fly from one loaf, one fish, in the hands of a miracle maker. As I write, my fingers will rest. No need to type. My voice will guide the keys. As I write, I imagine the young thumbly, sweet water coconut, tasty to drink, will be served outside the hothouse. As I write, scowl and sadness will turn to smiles and grays. That was a grand thirst quencher, my dear Cornish scientist. Congratulations to engineering survival. Let us raise our glasses. Thank you. You know, I, I know that in the in the invitation for this reading, I wrote a poem. I mean, um, it's in the room of poem it's by working, uh, yes. Alan Swift. I, I have another poem or I've written about Alan. It, 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 I'll just read this one. It's a, it's a sort of fantasy about Alan up on the upper east side. Cafe Ginsburg. I wake up dreaming, Alan, dapper in white linen suit, tie, pants, seated, sipping black coffee at a table. We're at the Met, the cafe on top overlooking the park. I walk over with my smart camera, and he gets up to shake my hand, give me a hug. Seeing his graciousness, other patrons emboldened come over wanting snaps. One even sits down beside him. He is alone, the table set for four, waiting clearly for someone. His publisher, a biographer, a late blooming love from the Upper East Side, or me. I want to take a selfie, a surreal one, I realize suddenly, as Alan no longer lives on Earth. I wake up again alive, blackberry on hand, ready to type. I realized the poem's a bit dated, as I mentioned, the Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time when the Blackberry was the technology. Um, <clears throat> I'll read now a poem from Sue Lille Nostalgic, just to hear the French a bit. This is a new book that just came to, from back from Paris, which was a wonderful trip, where I presented the book uh, at the Marché de Poésie. Le Pays à Côté, it's a book about uh, an island, really, a nostalgic island. Le pays à côté, the country beside us. Viens avec moi, la porte est ouverte, la citerne pleine, et il y a tout une île pour explorer, un univers dans la mer et sur la terre. Mais en même temps, rebondit la question, pour combien de temps? Un mois, un an, une vie? Et si le chat a neuf vies, pourquoi pas l'homme à l'étranger? De pays en pays, jusqu'à l'arrivée au pays sans chapeau. La roue de l'enterrement dans le cœur de l'Europe, en centre-ville. You notice I always have a hat on, because <laughs> I don't want to arrive at that au pays sans chapeau, the country without a hat, you know, which 
but you can imagine what that country is. And now um, I am, you know, with the debt to Rambo, uh, un carte plus loin que la décidée. Je ne sais rien. La catastrophe demande une réponse à sa mesure. Un saut plus haut de néant de ne jamais accepter le silence quand la langue est prête à recevoir les signaux de l'esprit pour les mesurer dans les vers. C'est une joie absolue de jouer avec des rimes la douceur et la force émotionnelle qui nous abîment, de les gérer, d'être maître de la maison du poème, même si la maison au-dessus de la vie que tu mènes est en train de s'effondrer ou bien de changer de forme, de disparaître comme l'avion que tu as pris pour t'envoler avec l'idée de repartir. Et même si tu es revenu et reparti plusieurs fois, même si tu écris dans la langue découverte encore dans cette île, à la fin de la journée, tu restes seul avec tes souvenirs. Qu'est-ce que nous offre de plus la vie d'anticipation de plans et de projets. Bien sûr, dans la maison de la poésie, il n'y a pas d'inconvénient avec le poète qui écrit au milieu de l'orage, quand il fait beau, quand l'amour...